pray, pray with me again. Father, we thank you that um, you are uh, the God that is uh, not satisfied to have a distant people. And uh, I just praise you that um, intimacy is your desire, that you um, were always the God that said you wanted to dwell in us and among us, and that you set us apart by your presence. And we just never seek your presence. And I ask, Lord, that you'd um, bless this time this morning as we, as we look into your word on this second Sunday of Advent. I ask that, um, that you would speak, that you would um, find that room, that space in our heart that you've set aside for yourself. And we love you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, I'm going to jump in here. So, second Sunday of Advent. The theme in the Advent conspiracy is spend less. Of course, the, um, that wasn't going to do it for me. Um, <laughs> we're going with that theme. I'm just, I'm just going to put out there, there's, there's something far deeper going on than just spending less. And actually, I appreciate um, Pastor Bianca so much. Um, she already preached the message. We could just go have lunch. Um, it, it was perfect alignment there. It's almost as if the same spirit is guiding our leaders around here. Um, but so what I want to say is I think spending less, if we're, if we're really going to take that to deep, to what, what Advent is about is it's about making space for him. Okay? And I actually think there's, there's two different things, and we're going to look at both this morning. One is making space. Okay? That's becoming a person where where the space inside of us is, is more for him than the busyness of other things, okay? Just being a person that is spacious for God. There's plenty of space for him. That's making space singular. I actually think the second thing we see in the Word of God in our lives is making spaces. Um, one of the things, um, yeah, one of the things the Lord called us to several years ago um, was actually this bu building, and I'm talking about the physical building. We actually received a word from the Lord um, to begin making spaces for him, plural. Not that it wasn't for him already, but it was to bring an excellence of spaces. In other words, an intentional about um, intimacy um, engages actual things. Now, you, you know that if uh, anyone who's married um, anyone who's had a close friendship with someone, we know that um, intimacy is not just some general idea. Intimacy is um, specific um, interactions of love happen in intimacy, and there are particular spaces that are created for what the Lord would do. Are we good so far? And, and, and you, you realize that Advent, uh, you know, literally meaning, let me see if I still have it in, yeah, literally meaning um, out of the dictionary, um, the arrival of a notable person or thing. So Advent is all about the fact that we have an extravagant God who, um, who wanted to arrive in the flesh, Jesus being the greatest fulfillment of what was always God's heart, that he wanted to be with us. He wanted his person to be with us, his presence. Advent's all about bringing presence. So um, if you want to go with me to Mark chapter 2, um, we're going to start on making space, okay? Making space. What is that? The singular making space, becoming a person of space, having space for God. And um, I'm going to begin, um, it struck me as weird, so it's okay if it strikes you as weird. Um, it came to me as I prayed about this, I feel like we, sh we need to talk about fasting, how many of you think of the Christmas season, you know, the month of December, as a month of fasting, right? We all plan to lose, mo lose weight during December. <laughs> well, I just want to put out there, and I think it's so important to talk about this. Um, I think to some extent, and I'm guilty of this, um, most of my life, and even still some now, um, I think of making sacrifices of fasting. Um, we're even going to talk a little bit about free will offerings, 
this morning, and I think we think um, we do not think properly about it. That's what I'm trying to say. Not given the finished work of Jesus. And so let's just begin here. Um, I'm going to start reading. It's Mark chapter 2, verse 18, if I didn't give that to you yet. And Jesus is going to be questioned about fasting here, and we're going to look at his response. And verse 18 says, The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came... I don't think I read that right. I'm going to try that again. Um, Verse 18, the disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, that's they came and said to Jesus, why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? Now, the first thing I'm going to put out is a lot of times when Jesus is asked a question in the scriptures, a lot of times it's by like the Pharisees or the Sadducees, and it's not a real question. They're trying to trick him and trap him. Um, get him to say something wrong. In this case, I actually think these are the disciples of John, and I think they're really curious. They're observing something that doesn't align with the way that they think it should go. This is weird, and I think they're legitimately asking him in this case. And this is what he has to say, verse 19. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Have you ever really noticed before that this whole new wineskin thing and and the sewing of the patch on the garment is actually part of Jesus' response about fasting? (laughs) I don't think I generally put the two together, but it's literally part of the same answer about something he wants us to understand. So what's going on there? What's his answer? He says, um, basically, he says, it doesn't make sense that the friends of the bridegroom would fast while they're with the bridegroom. Now, there's something really important here that I, I think we have to grab if we're going to understand any of this at all. And it, I think he's talking about the purpose of fasting. In other words, look at this. I want to tell you something about the the nature of God. God does not ask us for sacrifice, for offering, for fasting, because he wants wants to deprive us of something. (laughs) And I'm going to show you in the word of God his intention. You see, the purpose of fasting is this same heart we talked about last week. We're talking about again this morning. The purpose of fasting is to create space for intimacy. (laughs) <laughs> it's the removal, um, I think of uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Um, what does it say? Removing every weight and, and every hindrance, uh, the sin that is hindrance to keep us um, from k- keeping our focus on Jesus. And when you read that passage, it goes on into the discipline of God um, with us as his children. In other words, it's an intimacy passage if we went and read Hebrews 12 right now. But today, I I just want to tell you, he is answering the purpose of fasting. Why would it not make sense for for the disciples to have fasted when they were right there with Jesus? It doesn't get any more intimate than that, right? Right? That would be um, that would be a religious thing that has nothing to do with the purpose of the of the positioning that fasting is supposed to be. But now um, you see what they've done, and I'm going to suggest we still do it. Okay, (laughs) me too. I'm with you. I think we still do it. What we've done is we take these positioning things and we turn them into um, into a task. For God, in other words, in other words, and I'm going to show you as I keep reading this scripture. But let me just say what we do is we say, "I'm fasting for God." <laughs> Let's stop and notice that that doesn't make any sense um, because God doesn't need anything. He desires your intimacy greatly because He's nuts about you. 
but he doesn't need anything. So, um, so let me keep. So let me just suggest before we read on that we don't fast for God. We don't make an offering, and we're going to see this too today. We don't make an offering for God because He doesn't need anything. He gives us opportunity. He blesses us, and I'm going to prove it. He blesses us with um, the opportunity to fast for ourselves. <laughs> Right? Because the blessing's for you, and I'm going to show you. Let's read on. I'm going to keep reading in verse 23 here. Okay? Now, it's going to feel like it changes subjects, and it does a little bit, but I'm going to show you how it's connected. Verse 23, they begin to talk about Sabbath. Now, it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, in this case, it is the Pharisees, right? Verse 25, but he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. Now listen, here's why we're reading this. Verse 27, And he, that's Jesus, said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Did you catch it? Now i got to tell you something about, um, sometimes we still write this way, um, but not so much in our culture anymore. The second thing, when you have a conversation that goes on like this in the Word of God, what's said about the second thing relates to the first thing, okay? In other words, we can say this, this statement is made about the Sabbath. The Sabbath, um, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, man was not made for the Sabbath. It was made for the benefit of man. It's proper in our interpretation to notice that he's saying the same thing about fasting. Man was not made for fasting. Fasting was made for man. In other words, it's, it's for your blessing. And I want to tell you why. Fasting is all about removing the hindrance, the weight, the barrier that is, that is in the way, that is hindering your intimacy with him. Good so far? You know, we always think of fasting food, and I think we've moved on from that. Sometimes we fast time. We're going to have an extra devotional time. But I want to put out there, you know, some of the most important things to fast might be things like your anxiety over something. <laughs> That's the most common one for me. I'll just say I'm pretty good at anxiety. And um, someday I'm going to be all grown up, and I'm just going to trust the Lord. But sometimes I have to be really intentional <laughs> about I'm going to fast this anxiety, this fear I have over this thing. I'm going to have to release that to you. I'm going to do it as a positioning discipline. You see? And I, I've never, I, I grew up um, as a young guy, um, we'll just, We'll just leave it at this and say in a liturgical liturgical denomination. And um, I was taught that, that fasting was for the Lord, like I was saying a while back. And I could never understand. When, when the Lord first started presenting to me that it was for me, um, there, were, there was a long period in my life where I, I kind of began to take him at his word or began to learn. But it was a tough one for me to get because I could never understand how fasting would be for me. I mean, I'm a prime rib and bring on the potatoes guy. How could that possibly be good for me? <laughs> I would be doing this for you, obviously. I'd prefer the prime rib. And you see, when you understand the purpose of fasting, we can begin to see why it's for us. Why it's, it is actually God's extravagant love. He actually wants to bless. He's actually saying, lay aside every weight and every encumbrance, every hindrance that is between you and me because, because I'm, I'm nuts about wanting to get into intimacy with you. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I'm not satisfied with my relationship with you, and I hope you aren't either. Let me, let me give you the opportunity to move aside what's in the way. Are we good with that? Okay. 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 
In fact, let's talk about, I'm going to change it a little bit, but I'm actually going to suggest it's the same thing. Um, let's talk about offerings. And um, we won't go too deep into it, but we've got to talk a little bit about culture. Do you know they basically had four categories of offerings? Okay, I can even, I even brought a note. I can tell you what they are. They were, um, they were uh, burnt offerings, okay? They had sin or guilt offerings. Um, let, let, I'm not reading in the right place. Burnt offerings, sin offerings, guilt offerings, and peace offerings. And they were all a little bit different, one from another. Now, I want to tell you a surprising thing that we normally don't think of. Most of the offerings that they made, you know, you can read through um, the books, um, the books of the uh, Torah, and um, and you know, in Leviticus there would be instructions. And what the Lord would do was he he would say, you know, for this offering, I mean, bring a bowl and and two doves and an ephod of flour and a drink offering, and um, and splatter it with a little oil. Well, one thing we don't recognize is that's a good recipe, if you think about it, and it's because. Um, a, Aside from the, the strict, the burnt offerings, the other ones always had an aspect of consumption. In other words, it was a barbecue. Here's what I want to tell you. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. In fact, when, when he spoke about, about making, I, I think I've been using the word offering, which I didn't mean. I mean to say what we're talking about now is sacrifices, okay? You can't make a sacrifice that he doesn't have a plan to outbless. Every time we make a sacrifice, it is because he wants you to be nourished. Make sense? Well, let's talk about free will offerings. Um, and, then, and then we're going to read a little bit here and do something with this. Um, you know, they're different. The free, it would say, bring your sacrifices and your free will offerings. Well, here's, here's what I've got to tell you. The sacrifices were always very specifically um, designated by God. Kind of like the example I just gave. You know, on this day, you shall sacrifice this like this. But why do you do that? we re- got to remember, okay, remember some things that we're talking about this morning. One is, is the sacrifice is not for him. He doesn't need anything. <laughs> it was shadow, and we're going to talk about this, shadow of the sacrifice he made, but he doesn't need anything. The, the giving of the sacrifice was because he wanted to bless them and have relationship with them. So his idea is this is going to bless you, this is going to nourish you. Why was it so particularly laid out? Because he knew what they needed to give, right, in order to be nursed. You know he knows that about you too. He knows what needs to be sacrificed in order for you to be nourished, in order for you to be positioned to have intimate relationship with him. Good so far? Okay, so that's sacrifices. So he would say, this is what you shall sacrifice and this is how. And then he would say, and bring your free, free will offerings. You know what this is? This is a relational God who says, okay, you know, what would, you know what would be delightful? You choose something. <laughs> is it just me or does that delight you? When I say that, we, we, have, a, we have this, not this distant, far out there God. We've got a God who says, who says, I know you so well that I know what you need to give in order to be freed to have intimacy. But he's also the kind of God that says, but you know, I just delight in you. And so I can't wait to see you choose something. What do you want to offer? And you know what he says about that? He says, I'm also going to turn that into nourishment for you. I'm going to turn that into joy. I'm going to turn, I'm going to use that to build you up into one who's in intimacy with me. I withhold nothing from you. You withhold nothing from me. Is the relationship he's, he's looking for. He hungers for. You know, he hungers for a relationship with you, and that's the kind. Do you know the word of God? I have no idea where it's at at the moment. Some scholar in here probably does. It says he withholds no spiritual blessing from those who love him. That's good news. He hasn't withheld any... I didn't say he doesn't withhold things. 
okay? If you're like me and half the time you're asking for things that wouldn't be any good for you, I think he withholds a lot of things. What the Word of God says is he withholds no spiritual blessing because he's that nuts about you. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. Okay, now I'm going to show you this principle and then we're going to move to some. I'm trying to leave more time to be with him this morning as opposed to talk about him. So um, I'm, I'm going to keep moving through this. Go to Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to start in verse 24. And here's the principle. You've all heard these words before, but it's everything we've just been talking about. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, how many of you have spent most of your life thinking, who, you know, becoming a disciple of Jesus and following him really means you're going to have to give up a lot. I mean, listen to these words. Take up your cross and follow me. And I just want to tell you that this is the same principle we've been talking about when it comes to fasting, when it comes to sacrifice. He, he is not a God who asks you to neglect yourself. He's not a God who asks you to sacrifice anything, including your life, because he wants you to do without something. He's a God who asks you to sacrifice, take up your cross, to, to sacrifice your old dead life is what's being asked for here. Um, what died on the cross was not the life of Jesus. You all understand that, right? On a cross, the, the life of anything does not die. The cross of Jesus is exactly the opposite. It's the death of everything that hinders the life. And so he, when he says deny yourself and take up your cross, it's not because he wants you to be without or to lack anything. It's because he wants you to gain everything. Verse 25, for whoever, and here it is, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come, will come, in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. Notice it didn't say he will punish each one according to his works. No, it didn't say that. Um, many places in the Word of God, it establishes God as a rewarder. Go ahead and say it. He's a rewarder. <laughs> he doesn't have to punish. Do you know that? We punish ourselves when we choose what's contrary to him. <laughs> he doesn't have to do anything. He's a rewarder. He's an extravagant lover who never stops pursuing intimacy with you. And so, and so really, before we move into what I really want to say, um, the principle here is, you try, what is this? You try to hang on to your life. You try to hang on to, to um, what you think of as life pre-Jesus, and, and you still have some, I still have some hindrance and weight that we're shedding. Um, you try to hang on to that, and how do we end up undernourished? We end up lacking joy, and we end up fighting like heck just to survive this place the more we hang on to the false life. Good enough there? What, this, what Jesus is saying here is you lay down that life and you will end up nourished and full of life, full of joy. And I'll take the battle. <laughs> the battle to survive here will no longer be yours. I take that up for you. That's the principle. You can't outgive God. Did I say that already? Okay. So that's all about, look, that's all about um, creating space for him, which is kind of a big, broad thing. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means you have great, big, he's, he's transforming you into a person. He's inviting you to transform into someone who has great spaciousness, great space for him, to meet with him, 
to talk with him, to participate with him. That's creating space, singular. So what is it to create spaces? Um, go to Mark chapter 1 with me. I'm going to show you Jesus. Um, you know, Jesus is our only standard. Um, no, he's, he's the only model that we have. He's the word of God says that he's the, exact, he's the express image of the Father or the Godhead. There's no other model, no good teacher, no, um, no mentor in your life. I, I think God blesses us with mentors and we need them, with spiritual directors, advisors, people who love us well in the Holy Spirit, but they'll never be your model, right? Give me a nod. Jesus is the model. Now, this is Jesus and how he created spaces. Okay, this is um, Mark 1. I'm starting in verse 35. And it says, Now in the morning, having, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. You've all read that before, but now watch this. Verse 36, And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. <laughs> now I want to slow down for a minute because it's easy to read on and not really, put you, not really catch what's going on. I want to tell you, you know, they, um, that it, he was their rabbi, right? They were the disciples. He was the rabbi. In their culture, um, you would never get... Um, what do you say, disrespectful or, or snarky with your rabbi. You just wouldn't. In their culture, you just didn't do that. I mean, in our culture, it's actually what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to go home and check out and make sure I didn't tell you anything wrong or I didn't. That's, that's what we do. But in their culture, they would never, they would not do that. He was, he was the rabbi. And I want you to get a sense of this. When they come back and they say, everyone is looking for you, don't just gloss over that. I think, I want to tell you what's going on. He went off, you see, they're having this ministry. They're having this active ministry, okay? They're watching the kingdom of God break out with Jesus. They're participating. It's building crowds. They're going, oh, man, this is good. This is building to where to now we're starting to get somewhere. That's what they're thinking. And he is making, he's not neglecting to make space, spaces. He's already a spacious person for God. Now he's making spaces. He's setting aside, he's sanctifying, he's setting aside a moment to talk with his father. And I want to tell you what the disciples are doing. They're freaking out and they're becoming disrespectful. What they're doing is going, everyone is looking for you. You know what they're saying? We've been looking for you for three hours or whatever, whatever it was. Where have you been? There's people looking for you. <laughs> that's what they're doing with Jesus. I don't tell you, that's the response of the world. The more you make spaces for Jesus, the more you will find yourself in a ridicule like this. Even from, that, they're well-intentioned, okay? <laughs> they love Jesus, they're well-intentioned, but they have other agenda going on, don't they? In this moment, I'm going to tell you, it's the same thing that will happen with you. You do what's good, what cares for your soul, what fosters intimacy and set aside spaces with him, and you'll get ridicule because it doesn't align with the values and the busyness of this world. This is, this is spending less. People are going to come and go, where have you been? There is work of the ministry to be done here. That, that's what they're saying to him. There's stuff that there's people to be healed. We're finally building a crowd, and you, now you disappear? That's what they're doing. And Jesus knows that there is no higher priority than the intimacy he has with the Father. In fact, he understands that there is, there is no kingdom, okay? Hopefully you know what I mean by that. There's no, his only message ever was the kingdom of God is upon you. I tell you and I show you. That's all Jesus ever did. And he knows that there's no kingdom outside of this intimacy. There's no staying in the movement of the Spirit outside of this intimacy. Jesus knows that. But they come going, everyone is looking for you. Now, I love his response. We didn't even get to the good part yet. Is that good? Well, here comes the good part. Verse 38, but he said to them, 
Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I've come forth. <laughs> now, keep it in the context of the conversation. They, they come going, everyone's looking for you. And they must be thinking, we deserve a response from you, Jesus. Right? Answer for yourself. And he moves... In, in a sense, he moves right on past. It's one of these cases where he doesn't even address what they think they're concerned about. He moves right into, let's go to the next town. Well, what did they just tell him? They just told him, there's people right here that are looking for you. And he says, let's go to the next town that I may preach there also because for this purpose I've come forth. Now, I'm going to give you a principle here. In that intimacy is the only place we find our path. In that intimacy is the place where we're in touch with the voice of God so we know what we're up to. I'm going to suggest that this, this response is not random. He's not just ignoring um, their disrespect, if you will. <laughs> He's not just ignoring them. He's saying, I was just with my father, and so I actually know the next step. You guys don't have a clue because you were all too busy wrapped up in what you were doing instead of setting aside a sacred spot, instead of making spaces, plural. Is that good? And it's true for you too. Jesus is the only standard. He is modeling how we move. Advent is all about moving in the Spirit. Jesus came so you'd be filled with the Spirit, so you'd be filled with fire, so you'd know what you're up to. That's good news. That's not work or task. He's got that for your joy. <laughs> there is nothing more, and I would say, there's nothing more joyful than moving in the Spirit and, and what you're for, what you're up to, because God wants to bless you with it. And that's not even the right way to say it. What I should be saying is there is nothing, that is joy. <laughs> Anything else is a fake joy. It's a happiness that'll last for a moment. And then I, I just have to read one more verse there, verse 39. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. I just believe the word of God wanted you to know that, that um, wanted you to see the, the effectiveness, the power in his life because he was, first of all, he was a spacious person, okay? He was spacious for God. He made space, but he also made spaces. He knew what he was up to, so he did not lack for the power of the movement of what the Spirit was doing at, at any moment. Amen? You know you're made for that. I spend a lot of my life frustrated because I'm, I'm absolutely aware that I'm, I'm not moving in the power of the Spirit I was made for. I'm just being transparent. <laughs> it's frustrating to me. It brings me to my knees. It makes me pray. It makes me do silly things. It makes me wonder, what did I do wrong, Lord? <laughs> Talk about bad theology. And then he's got to correct me and say, you didn't do anything wrong. You know, it's, it's not your performance. It's the performance of Jesus that makes us fillable with the Holy Spirit and makes us able to participate in what he's doing. Amen? Okay, I'm going to go to this last passage. Now, all of that was just because I wanted to do this. Luke 22. Luke 22. We're going to start in verse 7. <clears throat> We're going to read a story here. This is about um, creating spaces, okay? These are people who are already spacious to some degree, his disciples, and they're going to create a space. And I'm going to suggest that this story, you've read this story, you, you know this story, most of you, and, um, and yet... You've probably never looked as hard as you could into the, into the spiritual significance of why it's worded like this. You ready? Here it is. They're going to create spaces. Um, 22 verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. 
Now, before we even move on, I got to tell you about some stuff, some things you know, because you're good. I'm going to tell you anyway. The Passover is, is the physical picture of, of what Jesus has done for you and for the whole world, right? Passover lamb, the Passover. And what he's asking them to go prepare is the Passover feast, which we're going to have together this morning. Okay, so I want to challenge you before we even move on to think this way as we move on, because I'm certain it's the truth. You are called to prepare Passover meals just like this. Please notice with me that Jesus did not go prepare it himself. It's just true. It's just, it's just a fact in the narrative. He didn't go prepare it himself. What it says is he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. See, now i got to tell you some things about this meal. This meal is all about the extravagant ab abundance of God's love for you and for everyone. That's what the Passover is. It's God's extravagance. And it is, it is our calling as disciples, just like Peter and John in this instance that we're reading, it's our calling to, to set a banquet <laughs> for those to invite people to a table that is not the table of this world and is specifically about the abundance that is provided because Jesus was broken and spilled his blood. It's the abundance of love. It's the feast of the abundance of love that you're called to set for people. You're one of the people. You, most of the time you've got to set that for yourself and you're invited to. You know that. <laughs> There's a place for you at his table. Half the time, the greatest barrier to sitting in your place at his table is, is yourself. Can we all agree with that? There's a, there's a space that has nothing to do with performance that is only ever about grace, a seat at the table, the table of grace that's just for you and the greatest barrier to going and sitting down and enjoying the abundance of that extravagant love is often you. Because we have hindrances and weights that need other concerns, other priorities, other idols, <laughs> other things of this world we cling to that keep us from going over to the table and having a seat. Yes? Okay, now watch what it says in the Word of God here. Okay, actually, I've, I've got to do this too. We're going to do a couple of cultural things here because it matters. Um, do you know when he said to Peter and John, go and um, prepare the Passover for us, that first of all, they would have been weirded out from the word go. Do you know why? Because guys wouldn't have prepared the meal. <laughs> they would have been thinking to themselves, um, which of the women do you want us to recruit to make? They probably couldn't slice a cucumber properly. You know, it'd be, <laughs> it'd be like, it was very, very weird for him to be asking them to go prepare it in their culture. Now watch this. With that in mind, I want to tell you that, that becoming a place that is both spacious and creates spaces means that we're people who are in touch with his voice and willing to follow him into the weird. I'm just putting it out there. No matter what, no matter what oddity, like no matter how much you are against my grain or what I've been taught since childhood or what our culture thinks, He's making us into a people who honor his voice. That's spaciousness for God, who honor his voice over any preconception about how this is supposed to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting all kinds of responses to that. It's going to become really obvious as we read on. Go to verse 9, okay? I want to propose, here's the question. What we're going to read next is the question that the disciples throw back at Jesus. I'd want to tell you before I read it, I believe it's actually a spacious question. They're actually purposely leaving space for relationship. They're, they're honoring his voice as the rabbi because there's lots of things they could have said or asked when he asked a couple of dudes to go prepare the Passover. Okay, so here's what they say. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? I really do. I believe they were being, they were being spacious. 
to the voice of God. Like, okay, they were weirded out. You know, they were. And they were going, okay, they were probably terrified. They probably didn't know how to prepare all the elements for the Passover meal. Like, they didn't even know the recipe for the dipping and, and more than likely. But now, well, just in case you think I'm stretching it, go to verse 10 with me. And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a, a pitcher of water. This is weirdo number two. <laughs> do you know what else men didn't do? Carry the water. So the city would have been bustling the Passover in Jerusalem. It would have been bustling. It would have been crowded like... Like, um, like a retail store during the Christmas season, <laughs> okay? It would have been like that. And you might ask, yourself, well, gee, they want him to find a guy carrying water? That's going to be impossible. That's like needle in a haystack. Well, actually, it's not true. It would have stuck out like a sore thumb. They would have seen the guy with the pitcher of water, and, and he's partly letting them off the hook. I actually think he's kind of saying, um, he's kind of saying, at least I'm not making you do the weird thing and carry the water. <laughs> I got somebody else to do it for you. <laughs> right? It's like when your wife has you carry her, will you carry my purse for a minute? <laughs> you know, it's that. And so, so weird thing number two, okay, goes on like this. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? I'm going to suggest that's weirdo thing number three. You really, you were invited. You didn't, you didn't put yourself out there and ask. This is a bold faith. In order to do this, this means that they, they already trusted the voice of their rabbi so much that they would do something that would be considered incredibly rude. They would have to have a serious boldness of faith <laughs> to follow through in getting to their seat at the table. Now the good part. Verse 12, then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. We've got to pay attention to these words a minute. The first one is large. <laughs> it's a spacious place. He will take you to a spacious place. Remember where, where the Passover, where's the Passover really happen now? It's so important to stop and do this. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The spacious place where you meet with him is in you. It's the upper room in you, okay? And this is a large place. He always intended for the space where you meet with him, where you recline at the table with him, is a spacious place on purpose. It's not an overcrowded, busy, distracted Bro uh, broke, I shouldn't say broke because there's, um, I'm, I meant financially. <laughs> where, where you've spent everything you have on everything else and by the time you get here, there's no space. First of all, you also realize um, they didn't recline at the table with kings. Do you know that? It would, it would have, this is an honor. Your seat at this table, even just in the, in the silly physical picture of this world, that you would recline at the table with a king, that you'd be invited, there's always a seat here for you, is extravagant love. You didn't feast with the kings? Are you kidding? Okay, what's the next word? So a large, furnished upper room. I want to tell you, I, I don't think that that's a detail. Why, why would that detail be there? Of course it would be furnished, right? I don't think there's any detail that's coincidence in the Word of God. In some of the versions, when translated, it says fully furnished. And here's what I've got to tell you. The moment you came to Christ... He, he made sure that in your meeting place with him, you have everything you need to have intimacy with him. You lack nothing you need 
to meet with the king of the universe and recline at his table. You don't lack any of the furniture required to have the deep intimacy in the upper room with your king and savior who crossed the universe because he was so um, dissatisfied with the intimacy he could have with you and always had a plan to make sure that he was going to have the kind of intimacy he desired. He crossed the universe. He laid down the divine attributes, according to the Hebrews, to become a man, to become a baby, to make sure that he was creating you as a temple of the Holy Spirit that had all the necessary furniture to have the fullness of intimacy with him. And it says, there make ready. Not just anywhere. <laughs> okay, he is a king. Go ahead and bring some reverence. It's not just anywhere. It says, there, in that place, make ready. In the large, spacious place that is set with all the necessary furniture to have intimacy with him. And so there's, look, there's a calling, and I, I think um, it's, it's all year, it's every day, but it's, it's an Advent thing. It's an Emmanuel thing. There's a calling to make space and to make spaces where we recline with the Master, where, where we, we bless Him and He blesses us, where we withhold nothing from Him and He withholds nothing from us. I'm His and He is mine. And we do that today when we, when we come to this table. And so verse 13 says, So they went and found it just as He had said to them, and, and they prepared the Passover. <laughs> it's probably the only sentence, I mean, most of the hundreds of times I read this passage in my life, um, that would be really the only sentence. He sent them to go do the Passover, and so they did. <laughs> go prepare the Passover. And it goes on, actually, and we're going right into the Lord's Supper now. In verse 14, it goes on, it says, And when the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. You see, they could do this because somebody went and prepared a space. And I believe this is like an onion. I think it's just, it's just truth. This is like an onion. You prepare, you set a table so that you've created a space to sit with Jesus. You're also called to do the go part, the Peter, um, the Peter and John part. You're called to, be, to take the abundance of that love to people. The rest of them came and sat at this table because, because Peter and John made it. And I, I just believed to the bottom of my heart that, that in the delight of the Father, um, Jesus is sending and the Holy Spirit is facilitating moments in your day, every day, when he's going, when he's going go ahead, set the table for these people. Set the table for the abundance of my love. <laughs> they don't know that they can recline with me. And it, it's a kind word. It's you, you give something. The Spirit moves you to speak to this person. The Spirit moves you to give someone something, to take care of something, to help someone through something. And we are, we are setting the table of that abundance. That's creating spaces for God to meet the heart. Is there any greater privilege in all the universe than to hear Jesus say, go, go and set the table of the abundance of my love for people? And then here's his heart, verse 15. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now listen, this is so important. And then we're going to have this meal. He says, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. You know, he's going to have, we're going to recline at the table with him right now. And he's going to do this with you in presence, in that intimacy we're talking about all morning. In other words, what? We are doing it in the fulfillment of the kingdom today. 
kingdom is upon you. And we show it, right? What was always his message? The kingdom's upon you, and then he would prove it. He would show it. Well, that's what we're doing this morning. We're declaring before a spiritual audience that the kingdom is upon us. And now we're going to show, we're going to show off. <laughs> we're going to show it. We're going to recline at the table and we're going to physically eat bread that represents his broken body. He was broke because he always intended for you to be whole. And his blood was spilled because he always intended for you to be covered in the blood, appearing perfectly righteous before the throne of the Godhead. I, um, if it's okay with you, I want to take a moment to ask the Holy Spirit, um, what is crowding the space? I promise you, promise you, everyone in here, I and you have things that are crowding the space that is supposed to be his. <laughs> that he always wanted to be his space. Um, whether it be fears, anxieties, as we talked about, desires, wants, your own personal agenda things, good things sometimes, good desires sometimes can even crowd the space that was meant to meet with him. And so in just a moment, I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite you to, um, to just um, close your eyes, relax, gain a sense of the Spirit who is already right there with you. And let him surprise you this morning, maybe. There may be a weight or a hindrance that you have been completely unaware of the fact that it is creating a barrier to the intimacy he desires, he fervently desires to have with you. And so, Holy Spirit, right now we ask you, will you just reveal to us the weight, the hindrance, the block that is in the way of our intimacy with you. Now, if he's revealed something to you, and even if he hasn't, <laughs> this is your opportunity um, to just recline at the table. I actually invite you to let, to let an image form in your mind. Lord, we ask that you would sancti set apart our minds as a meeting place for you. Set apart this place in our hearts. And we ask you, Lord, for an, an image of our seat at your table. And when you have that image, just allow yourself to recline in the place where he's not worried about that thing that hinders you. You can let it go at this table and just receive what he has for you. Jesus. Now I want you to do this. I want you to take, take the bread and just hold it. He says, this is my body. This is my body that was broken for you. So what I want you to do is, this may be new to you, break it. And just go ahead and look at it. Broken. his heart, he promises that he is going to finish the work that he started in you. He was broken because it was always his idea that you would be whole. You will be perfected as he sees you um, when you see him fully as he is. I invite you just to meditate on that for a moment. And when you're ready, go ahead and partake of the bread. Okay. 
Now take, hold your cup. And I want to talk about this for a minute. It's one thing we kind of glossed over. In the Old Testament, those sacrifices we talked about um, were all shadow of Jesus. In the book of Hebrews and other places in the, new, in the new covenant, do you know what sacrifices we make? None. <laughs> the free will offering becomes a really big thing because we no longer make sacrifice. It's rec recorded in the book of Hebrews and other places that the final once and for all sacrifice has been made in the spilling of the blood of Jesus. Our only job now is to consume him fully, that he is our all in all. He is our complete nourishment in the finished work of Christ. We explode with gratitude as we talked about and we make free will offerings because he wants to bless us with those opportunities. But it is actually a false idea that there's any further sacrifice for you to make. <laughs> Jesus made the final, once and for all, untouchable, unstainable, unstoppable <laughs> sacrifice. So there's no other sacrifice that ever has to be made for your intimacy with him. I invite you just to meditate on that for a moment. No more required performance. Nothing further for you to do. Nothing for you to get right. Nothing for you to avoid. You are his in this blood. Meditate on that and when you're ready, partake in the cup. Who's blessed? <laughs> thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your grace that was in this meal. And we do ask that um, every word that was from you this morning would be protected. The enemy cannot touch it. Every seed that was planted for those that are in here and those that are out on video. We declare in the authority of the name of Jesus that this cannot be touched. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just release a blessing. Release a blessing. Release, um, release an outpouring of your presence upon, upon those out there who may have done things even for the first time this morning to initiate intimacy with you. We ask unstoppable blessing and the fire of your spirit to meet them. In the name of Jesus, amen.